happiness, fulfillment, the ability to live a sustainable life, all these are the concern in the modern idea of human rights. On Sunday, China published a white paper on its progress in human rights over the past 70 years. So what are the highlights? In addition to work to lifting more than 700 million people out of poverty in the past 40 years, what are China's efforts in improving people's lives? And with the vision of building a community with a shared future, how should China work with the international community to advance global progress? Well, to talk more about these issues, I'm happy to be joined in the studio by Professor Zhang Wei, co-director of the Institute for Human Rights at China University of Political Science and Law, and our current affair commentator, Einar Tengen. Also, via satellite in Tokyo, we'll also be speaking to Mr. Fraser Cameron, director of the EU Asia Center based in Brussels. And that is our topic. This is Dialogue. I'm Li Chou sitting in for Yang Ray. All right, so I want to first get your take on, you know, your response to this white paper. Professor John, let me start with you. This is China's answer to the human right problem. What's your reaction after seeing that? Uh, it provides a historical development of human rights in China. Uh, some of the experience we had, uh, we uh, have gone through, and also uh, uh, the future development yeah. we, we want to advance. So this is basically China offering its side of the human rights debate, isn't it, Einar? Well, it's not its side. There's just different cultural perspectives. I mean, in the United States, both countries are founded by revolutions. All right. But in the United States, we reserve the right to be skeptical. Uh, we love our country, but we don't trust those who lead us. This is uh, something that Donald Trump has brought to the forefront. He's always talking about them, you know, the entrenched bureaucracy, the enemies of the people. Uh, in China, it's quite different. You love your country and you trust your government. And the government is supposed to provide an area where you are safe in your home, at your work, your school, wherever you are. I mean, this, uh, for instance, in Beijing, most cities in China, I mean, you can walk around at 4 a.m. as a single woman and not fear that you're going to be done. This is not something that would happen in most American cities, in, in the rural towns maybe, but in those areas don't. I mean, economic uh, rights are considered human rights uh, from the Asia perspective. All right, but it's not just Asia versus the U.S. I mean, if you, if you go to the Middle East, there are ideas about uh, the way that they practice the religion, how they see the world is part of their rights. Mm -hmm. So the problem is that you have a kind of monolithic, this kind of American exceptionalist view that there's only one set of human rights that is based on norms that are particular to the U.S. And I don't think that that necessarily works. It's a kind of colonial attitude that probably should have gone away some time ago. Each country has to enjoy the way that they, they do that and define human rights in their own terms. Now, this will be anathema to many people watching, but I think they should think about it a little bit, that there are differences and that we should be respecting them. And Professor John, I see you nodding along. Uh, you agree with what's being said by Einar? I mean, China's interpreting the human rights in a sort of a different way. Here is China's interpretation um, of basic and primary human rights, subsistence and development. Talk to us more about there this. There are differences, but uh, it's not that big. Uh, I mean, uh, human rights are established after Second World War by international uh, universal declaration of human rights and uh, later on by international treaties. So most of the UN member states ratify those treaties. So they, that means that many of the human rights we call today in the reality world, they are protected by law. Mm -hmm. So and also they can be uh, remedied by law. So this is uh, uh, commonly recognized uh, human rights in the whole world. But in, there are many different views about human rights also in different areas, for example, uh, China emphasizes on the right to development as, uh, uh, because we sacrificed during the Second World War and also we were colonized many years uh, by the Western powers. So as uh, one of the developing countries, uh, China is very eager to have uh, economic development with full independence. So this was one of the main uh, development goals for China for a certain period of time up to today. Uh, but many Western countries may not recognize that. Uh, uh, for those countries, especially the United States, I think that the most important thing would be 
political rights. Uh, they, they think they want to safeguard this in the constitution also around the world. Uh, but up to uh, 1993, I think uh, most states recognize that human rights should be equal, should be inter, dis, uh, inter independence. Yeah, but when we're, t we're talking about this, we're talking about the rights of the stable, women, all right, minorities, uh, things like this. Uh, it's equality of human beings. And I think if you start looking at the report, China emphasizes that a lot. It talks about the development in this area, correct? Mm -hmm. And it goes through the history and what has happened there um, in areas uh, throughout China mm -hmm. where longevity has been increased, access to water, sewer, electricity, communications, health care, education, going on and on. These are the types of things, a social safety net. These are the types of things that define how China looks at human rights, which is perhaps a little bit different right. than other places. China has certainly come a long way over the past 70 years. Let me also bring you in, Mr. Fraser, uh, Cameron Fraser. So from the founding of the PRC to the reform and opening up, and now uh, the recent year's efforts in building socialism with Chinese characteristics for a new era, how would you characterize China's progress in human rights for the past 70 years? Well, in terms of how China defines human rights, it's obviously made enormous progress, as was characterized by the uh, report just issued. At the same time, China and every other country practically has signed a universal declaration of human rights. And, of course, many countries in the world which have signed that declaration have not lived up to it. And this is not just China. You can think of Saudi Arabia. You could think of Cuba, many other countries. But at the same time, I agree with the previous speakers. There's a lot of hypocrisy, certainly in Western countries, about how we regard the progress that other countries have made. We tend to think that our definition is better than the definition of others, and we tend to operate a system of double standards relating to third countries. So I don't think we should be preaching quite as much as we often do in terms of human rights. We ought to recognize more the progress that countries have made, including China here, including Cuba, for example, and its health and educational uh, systems, which in many uh, areas are actually better than the United States. Now, it's got worst record, obviously, in terms of individual freedom, and that's what America focuses on, and that's what America focuses on when it looks at China, and as do other countries. But it is a more nuanced debate than some people might think. Now, Einar, uh, what's, uh, what's your take on this universally, uh, universal declaration on human rights, uh, the understanding? Is it really um, universally recognized? Is there a standard or model for developing human rights, or should diversity be, re be respected? Well, no, the, the, the individual rights that we're talking about, and this is the quality, that, that, that basis, that you are a human being, you therefore have rights, all right, and they, they should extend into, you know, you, how you, your, your beliefs and your political system, things like that. But, you know, th this is one of the problems that you have. In, in today's world, um, if you go back 30, 40 years ago, uh, China was the ideologue. They're insisting that you know uh, communism was the uh, universal form and that everybody should get to that. And the U.S. was very pragmatic, and they say, "Listen, everybody's a little bit different. Uh, you know, we should let people be where they." Now today, the United States, in essence, saying there's only one answer, and it's our brand of liberal democratic capitalism, and this is the only answer, and you should learn from us. Unfortunately, the world is looking at the United States, and it's not quite the same picture that perhaps people are trying to project there. It seems things are in disarray. People are more divided. Economic in inequality is increasing. The middle class is decreasing. All right? The shared wealth has gone down. The, the social network is being, in essence, in many cases, dismantled. So if you start looking at the U.S. from a, a Chinese perspective, it would be wanting. From the U.S. perspective, China is wanting. But these are cultural perspectives. They're not the reality. Now, Fraser, there have long been existing concerns about politicizing the human rights issues, especially among developing countries. Uh, to what extent do you think human rights issues are now being politicized? How do you look at the developments of human rights while recognizing uh, there's an overall gap between developing and developed countries? Well, they're always being used for political purposes. I mean, countries tend to 
bash other countries for their human rights record when they uh, really don't want to take any other uh, action. I mean, when I referred previously to hypocrisy, you look at the reaction of the Trump administration to the appalling murder of the Saudi journalist Khashoggi when literally there was no sanctions imposed against Saudi Arabia, not even really any harsh words by Trump, and now the relationship is back to normal again. So that's the type of hypocrisy I was talking about there. And I think that, you know, we have to be a bit more humble in how we sort of go about um, our human rights agenda. We should not give up our principles, but we should take into account the perspectives of other countries. I mean, we have big differences with the United States on other issues. I mean, when I used to work in Washington, I spent a lot of time lobbying against the death penalty. And that's gradually having some impact. I think about half of American federal states no longer use the death penalty now. So it's an area where we have lobbied strongly uh, and it's having some impact. And that shows you the differences that exist between Europe and the United States on some human rights issues. And Professor Zhang, your thoughts on this? Yeah, I agree with him that uh, there are differences. But uh, in the past uh, 20 years, we also see uh, the uh, differences are growing smaller, especially uh, uh, in the recent uh, several uh, 10 years. I think uh, China has been becoming more and more open to the outside world. There are many international uh, dialogues between Chinese government and other national governments. And also, Chinese government has been supporting national reports to UN treaty bodies and also state reports to the United Nations uh, UPR procedure. Uh, th through this, all those uh, exercises, I think uh, many uh, Chinese government officials, scholars have learned a lot from these exchanges. And uh, uh, we also learn from our, the criticism from other countries. This, I think it's not all bad because they help you to find out the problems you have. Then you are able to work on that. And sometimes probably you live in a country that you don't feel that. Or sometimes you may be too self-proud. You don't even want to look at the uh, bad parts of your society. But uh, I think Chinese government is now getting more and more open to look, look at these uh, problems we're having. But uh, being open does not mean that there's going to be a homogeneous uh, definition of what constitutes you know, this kind of universal human values. And you should separate that from this, this sense of uh, human rights. All right, values and rights are a little bit different, especially when you go to different places in, in, in the world. So I, I agree that you know, every country should be looking out and less preaching, more practicing. Right. But more in the education. End, more education, exactly. The, speaking as a professor, right? <laughs> no, <laughs> I, no, no it, it's, it, these things should not be overlooked. They should not be minimized. They should not be trivialized. Every country has room for improvement. The realities of wielding power and having the re economic responsibilities, the social responsibilities, is sometimes you say, well, we just get this done. All right, this is more important than something else. But there's always has to be a question. And whether those questions are coming from the outside, uh, people saying, well, you should pay attention to this, or inside is that, well, maybe we went too far, we have to adjust things. Mm -hmm. But there has to be some patience with that. It cannot be something where one nation dictates or proselytizes to others when it doesn't even follow its own preachings. I mean, you know, we're, you talk about the, the UN. Uh, the U.S. is, in essence, dismantling. It's threatening, you know, funding. It hasn't paid in some instances. Uh, it's trying to take down the international order that was created, that was mm -hmm. going to be part of this new world, all right? So in that instance, you know, it, it doesn't sound right. The hypocrisy drips when you start talking about that, you know, starting wars in countries where there was no things, the human cost that we are now facing, that Europe is facing with all of these refugees, they didn't come from nowhere. They came from the wars that we started, mm -hmm. and right. I mean the U.S. Hold your thoughts. We're going to take a short break here on The Dialogue. We're going to talk more after the short break. Stay with us. Reviewing rare diplomatic archives. Looking back on historic moments. Recalling major diplomatic decisions. 
remembering the names and faces. From 1949 to the present. Images may appear to be identical, but looks can be deceiving. The difference is not always obvious. It has to be discovered. There are always different sides to a story. We put the focus on the details. To see more, to understand better. See GTN. See the difference. Welcome back to the dialogue. I want to talk about China's um, efforts in poverty reduction. China has done an incredible job in reducing the poverty rate at a speed matched by no others. Um, these are some of the facts. Over the past 40 years, the number of rural poor fell from over 700 million to roughly 16 million. And China was also the first developing nation to hit that UN Millennium Development Goal for poverty reduction, which represented 70 percent of the global poverty reduction effort. Um, Einar, to you, what does that say about China's determination um, in providing its citizens the basic rights? Okay. I want to throw one caveat in there. Poverty reduction is not something you conquer. There's always further goals. And lifting up people beyond, quote, the UN poverty level is one of the things that China is trying to do. But, you know, this accomplishment is a more amazing when you consider that when Deng Xiaoping takes over, China has no foreign reserves to speak of. They have nothing literally nothing. No banking system, no insurance. There's none of the things that we take for granted in an advanced society. So from having nothing, I mean li literally having nothing, they were able to attract companies in. There was an environmental cost to that. Uh, foreign companies came in, they created jobs. Now that money was used to further uh, the benefit all of these people, 700 million people, uh, pu pulling them out of a situation. Is it perfect now? No. But the issue is, which governments all right, are actually trying to do something about it? Which governments talk about it but do nothing? This is where I'm saying that practice is worth a lot more than preaching. And this is where something where China has been recognized in doing this. It hasn't said that when the, you know, the when war and poverty is over that it's over. They continue to say that there will be a more inclusive, uh, socially fair, um, and balanced society going forward. And this is why a lot of the emphasis in the last five-year plan was on social development rather than just saying economics, economics, economics. Right. Professor Zhang, your take on this? And also from a global perspective, how serious is the impact of, of poverty on threatening human rights? Uh, on the global set, probably uh, many countries would agree that Chinese government uh, is able to fulfill its promise on the international level, not only at home to uh, improve the uh, livelihood of uh, our, uh, Chinese people, but on the other side, you see that uh, one Belt, uh, Belt Road uh, initiative through this, all these things, uh, Chinese gov government has been also providing a lot of lots of international helps to uh, developing countries, especially in African. Uh, continent. I think uh, uh, this is one, uh, it fulfills uh, Chinese philosophy. You know, um, you're, when you are able to help other people, you al always want to do that with good, uh, good faith. Yeah, it, it, I mean, along those lines, it, 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 the kind of help that China is voting, for instance, in Africa, desertification, you know, the loss of arable lands uh, to, you know, wind and, and desert is a real big issue. Water conservation is a huge issue. China is helping them with technologically appropriate things. I was uh, in northern um, Inner Mongolia where they were talking about how they've been turning about the desert and now they're using those in Nigeria and throughout all these parched areas of Africa. And it's simply digging trenches in a certain way, covering them with grass so that they become traps for the dust and things like this. Mm -hmm how to use drip irrigation to turn what was, in essence, land that could not be farmed into beautiful flower flowering places. Mm -hmm. So these are the types of things that China looks at. This is human rights. If you are not able to feed yourself, mm -hmm. talking about free expression would seem irrelevant. If your child is starving to death, talking about, you know, 
I, I, I need a vote. A vote for what? I mean, and, and I'm not saying you don't have votes. I'm just saying that all of these things that sometimes are brought up and China is criticized on. That no one really talks about the other side of it. What are you going to do about the real conditions of these people? Right, there is an order of priority there, no doubt. And we want to also talk about global governance of human rights. Fraser, I uh, want to get your take on this. China opposed that fairness being reasonable and inclusiveness are the basic principles of international human rights governance. But what are the implications of being fair, reasonable, and inclusive in global human rights governance? What does that entail? Well, the whole question of human rights governance is questioned by uh, many countries. There's no, there are a number of universal principles, and many countries have signed up to them, but not all countries actually follow them. So it's not uh, a case of everyone agreeing what these principles are and how human rights governance should be organized. We have the UN Human Rights Committee in Geneva. It looks regularly at human rights abuses in different countries, but it doesn't have really any follow-up um, to do so. The European Union probably has the toughest uh, human rights approach, both to its own members and those members in the Council of Europe. For example, it expelled uh, Russia after the invasion of Crimea. It's now been allowed back in as an observer status. But it is quite difficult to reach uh, agreement on a regime where everybody signs up to. I think it's probably a better route when you're talking about governance to actually try and bring in here the whole question of the rule of law. That is something the Chinese Communist Party recognizes is important in China for its future development. And it's, I think, a subject area where you're more likely to get agreement than simply uh, trying to move forward on a purely human rights agenda, because that is still the subject of rather acrimonious debate. And now, globalization and multilateral frameworks such as the Paris Accord on climate change and the Iran nuclear deal are facing strong headwinds. Fraser, once again, over to you. We have also have problems like Brexit and the United States turning more and more inward, putting America first. Will the surge of protectionism impact the development of human rights? Well, there's no question that human rights has gone down the agenda since the Trump administration came into power. He's hardly mentioned the words human rights. It used to be the European Union and America, plus some others like Canada and Australia and New Zealand that took the lead. Now, with America gone walkabout, um, there's less, I would say, global pressure on many countries. When it comes to climate change, I think the biggest uh, threat is actually trade sanctions. We saw at the recent G7 summit when the Amazon forest was ablaze, that Macron took the lead and said, if Brazil does not get this under control, it won't be having a trade deal with the European Union. And I think that had an impact there. So I think people are moving away from just looking at human rights on its own. It's actually starting to look more at environmental issues, climate change, number one issue this week at the United Nations. Mm -hmm. They're all coming together in terms of focusing just purely on human rights. And Professor John, what do you think China's role should be in all of this? Uh, Chinese government has been playing a more and more active role on the global level, in particularly in the United Nations. Uh, as we can see that China has ratified most of the core human rights treaties uh, from, uh, by the UN and also participated in all the uh, state reports procedures. Uh, at the same time as China, in the Human Rights Council, Chinese government has been always promoting peace uh, promoting human rights around the globe, promote dialogue, exchanges. Uh, I personally believe that um, if you really create uh, exchange programs among states, you learn from each other, UN can be a better place uh, to be instead of being uh, fighting, quarreling with each other without finding solutions. I, I think Chinese companies are trying to help to uh, find solutions for the future now. Manana, are your thoughts? I, I'm much less optimistic uh, than my colleague. I, I think things are descending more into regionalism. I think you, uh, with, with China, with the uh, Belt and Road Initiative, uh, with RCEP, uh, you know, it's, it's moving away from uh, the UN, not because it wants it to, 
simply because without the U.S. participating and basically undercutting it at every level. I mean, the U.S. does not uh, adhere to, these, uh, to the principles of the IC International Criminal Court. It says, no, we don't accept mm. that. Uh, we didn't accept uh, the, the UNCLOS, the UN Convention on Law of the Seas. Uh, in essence, the leader who created uh, all of these things says, well, but we're not bound by it. So how can you have a rule of law? when the most powerful say that we do as we please, not as we tell you to do. So this is creating a kind of crisis at the international level, and, and it's leading to more countries looking economically, politically, and culturally more towards uh, areas are surrounding them, trying to keep peace, trying to prevent. Uh, and peace now, as, and I would agree with Fraser on this, is a lot about uh, the economics uh, the environment, things like this. When talking about the, the economics, the Belt and Road Initiative has been brought up a lot of times in our discussion. Fraser, uh, from the ancient Silk Road to the Belt and Road Initiative, um, from your perspective, how does connectivity play to impact people's livelihood? How can China's vision of building this community with a shared future serve to improve global human rights governance? Well, the principle's fine. Um, China's already had a few problems in practice in terms of dealing with certain uh, countries, not taking sufficient account of the environment or the financing. So I think it's the first two or three years have um, shown some, some lessons have to be learned. And I think at the second summit, which I attended last year in Beijing, President Xi Jinping recognized that changes had to be made. Uh, I think there are still one or two issues. China is still, for example, financing some coal-fired power stations along the Belt and Road, which I think is not really compatible with the Paris climate change goals. So I think it's going to be a learning process with pressure on China to live up to these climate change goals and at the same time take into account all the development issues, which includes human rights, good governance, rule of law, and future Belt and Road projects. But as I say, more and more contacts are now taking place between China and certainly European partners. Other countries are following suit. This week, for example, Prime Minister Abe of Japan will be in Brussels signing a connectivity partnership with the European Union. So where China has pioneered connectivity, other countries are now following through on it. All right. That's going to do it for this edition of Dialogue. We appreciate all the insights from our three guests. Mr. Fraser Cameron joining us via satellite, our Einar Tangen commentator here at CGTN, and Professor John. Thank you. And that's going to do it for us. We'll see you next time. Bye for now. <laughs>